Alright guys, so um, when I was in college, I was studying psychology and for the first couple of years I would spend a lot of time in the school bookstore, um, just getting textbooks or, you know, scandrons or whatever, and while I would stand in line, I would look at the magazines, and of course, the only magazine that really would catch my eye was always the Psychology Today, and sometimes there were other magazines on um, music or, you know, politics or, um, like Scientific American, which depending on, you know, the headline or the cover would sometimes, you know, be interesting and sometimes not, but Psychology Today is, I always found interesting, and, um, granted this is a little bit more, uh, I guess you'd call it pop psychology, so, like, popular psychology, like how to handle people and relationships and stuff like that, um, you're not, you're not really gonna be finding a lot of the, you know, you're not gonna find them talking about Freud in here or about, um, you know, Pavlov's theories or about hardcore neuroscience or anything like that. It's just going to be, um, stories about, oh, they've done a study on this that reveals this information, and here's how you can apply that to your life. So, it's not even really strictly for people interested in psychology, but a lot of it is just, you know, about living and the people that you deal with regularly and to a certain extent yourself. So I thought it might be interesting to flip through some of these and see what we can learn from the world of psychology. Um, I've been wanting to do more stuff on psychology, but I was not sure how to go about it, and I recently found this stack of magazines. Um, there's a lot more than what I show you in this stack. Um, in front of me I just have like four, but I have a lot more than that. So the first one that comes up is Four Secrets to Creativity, um, which is four things that, you know, research finds. Um, help you deal with creativity. So, the first one says, if you are sleepy. So, for example, if you're a morning person, try writing at night. Um, and while usually, you know, you would think that alertness would be crucial, um, that is for more, you know, logical things. When you're tired, your brain wanders and it can make random connections and that can help a lot. Which explains why people always come up with great ideas just as they are falling asleep. Uh, I don't know if you guys experience this a lot, but I do that a lot with my poetry, where I'll come up with a great idea for a poem, or a great line to use in a poem that I'm working on, and I have to either, you know, be willing to disrupt myself, and it's, it's funny, you have to either, um, figure out, okay, is this really as creative as I think it is in my, you know, have a sleep mind? Is this something I'm going to look at and it isn't going to make any sense in the morning? Okay, so number two is to plan ahead. So they're saying, you know, popular belief is that creativity comes from these eureka moments where suddenly it strikes you, but that is actually not the case. Um, setting aside specific times during the day to be creative will reduce the stress and will help that sort of creativity flourish, which makes a lot of sense. I like to, you know, reserve a certain amount of time before bed for, um, well, usually like watching ASMR videos and, um, writing. So, and that's helped a lot, especially, um, with the last month. The month of April was, um, poet, uh, National Poetry Writing Month, or 30 Poems, 30 Days. 
So every night before bed, I would put aside a period of time to write, and that helped me a lot. Um, my poems later in the week, where I'd grown used to that, were a lot better than the ones earlier in the week, at least in my opinion. Are you butting heads? Um, so embracing conflict often leads to novel thinking, um, and forces you to think outside the box. Instead of feeling pressure or stress, recognize the potential in making sense of contradictions. Um, this makes me think about how um, people will often talk, and I do this myself, where after an argument, you come up with a million different ways you could have won that argument. Um, especially if, in the actual argument, you lost. Um, sometimes, even if you did win the argument, you'll think of a bunch of better ways you could have won, or sometimes, at least I'll come up with ways that the other person could have won, like what I would have done if I was arguing the opposite point, you know, just kind of for fun, but, um, I can see how, thinking about that, how that would, um, spark creativity. This one says, ditch the library. A bit of background noise can enhance creativity. Uh, but don't blast the television just yet. Too much noise impairs our ability to process information. To promote abstract thinking, we need just the right amount of distraction. About the volume level you would find in a cafe. Uh, also makes sense. You need enough going on around you where there's sort of a hum of stuff going on in the background where you can uh, hear snippets of conversation or, um, you know, uh, just get distracted, but if it's, you know, like the television blaring and it's a lot of noise, then there's just one big thing for you to be distracted by instead of lots of little things. Let's see. What else? Oh, here's one. Finding things. Where did I put my keys? Three tips for more fruit. Finding. So the first one is thinking out loud. So, you know, talking out loud about just now I was here, and then before that I was here, or, you know, after I came in from the house, I walked in here, and then I did this, I picked up the mail, I locked my car, I put my jacket away, and, you know, then you kind of remember like, oh, I put my jacket away, I must have put my keys in my jacket pocket, let me check there. Trust your gut. Um, makes sense, really, if you have, a, you know, gut feeling about something, even if you have no conscious memory of putting it there, it's likely that that might be where you put it. Use all your senses. So pay attention to smells, textures, and sounds to help tease things apart. Don't just rely on, you know, seeing things in a place and what you've seen. Um, think about, you know, did you remember hearing the jingle of the keys or feeling something or, you know, whatever. This is an interesting one. It says, calm down, boys. Adolescent girls have ADHD too. I'm not gonna focus on the whole article, but it's interesting because it is true that there are problems with overdiagnosis of ADHD in guys. Um, that can often be the problem with a lot of um, mental illnesses. Uh, for example, women are more likely to be diagnosed with depression um, just because, you know, they're more likely to be diagnosed. It's Whereas ADHD, guys are more likely to be diagnosed with, um, same thing, guys are also more likely to be diagnosed with anger issues than women. Although, it's not certain that, you know, these are all because of actual disparity in who has what mental illnesses. In this case, it looks like they're making the case that just because more guys get diagnosed with ADHD doesn't mean more guys have it. Let's see this one. It says experts find less.
lessons in their most valuable on-the-job blunders. Um, I guess it's talking about making professional mistakes and how, you know, how people try and learn from it, the different ways people will learn from their mistakes. Myths about cheating. There's an interesting one. Myth is that only a few bad apples cheat. Truth. Uh, let's see. Almost everyone is guilty of small acts of deceit. You know, something as small as stealing a pen from work. Uh, myth. We cheat only for our own gain. Truth. There is some kind of release of moral judgment that happens when helping other people. People cheat most when their performance benefited a stranger. Myth, you will cheat just this once. Truth, we don't always register small, dishonest acts. Um, but more obvious ones can reinforce negative self-image. So, you know, like I said, stealing a pen from work, cutting in line, you don't think of that as cheating. But, you know, cheating on a test or something, or cheating on, cheating in a relationship... Is, is big. <laughs> Let's see. This field Guide to the Contrarian defines the phrase, goes against the grain, never hesitates to inject a contradictory viewpoint, whether at a department meeting or a grandma's Thanksgiving dinner table. Habitual sender of email forwards promoting offbeat philosophies. If you say right, the said butter goes left. Got it backwards. Society is nothing but a political swarm of lemmings. Oh my gosh. I've, yeah. I think everyone knows someone who's at least a little bit like this. Um, oh, they have case studies. So, the political deviant. So, you know, the person who's mostly contrarian about political opinions the out-of-context dresser. So, you know, usually a young person or a teenager, um, I definitely knew kids like that in high school. <laughs> I'm not going to focus on this whole article, but this quote caught my eye. Have you ever watched a single abysmal YouTube cover of a song? Dreams are not always beautiful things. <laughs> kind of mean, but kind of funny. Yeah, this is one of the bigger articles. visual auras, gastrointestinal problems, vomiting, 
loss of appetite, nausea, diarrhea, a run of the mill headache is just the pain, just a, just literally just a headache, um, but without any of the other symptoms. It's not a migraine. As someone who gets migraines, I find myself having to explain this to people quite a bit, uh, because, you know, they think that, um, you know, it's just like any other headache and you can work through it. Whereas people who have actually had a migraine have a bit more understanding of the pain that you're going through. Literally pain. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it, it gets, it gets bad. I get the aversion to light and noise. Um, haven't had paralysis or visual uh, the visual auras are interesting because um, it's, it's basically they just call them auras really but it's sort of you can see it coming when you're about to get a migraine and sometimes I can see it coming and I think that depends on what it is that triggers it like if I feel like I'm getting a migraine for watching TV for too long or spending too long in front of the computer or if it's because I'm dehydrated, then I'm more likely to see it coming. Whereas sometimes I'll wake up with a migraine, and in that case, there's really no way you can get an aura from that. But, yeah, I get that. Um, and for me, if I wait too long without doing anything, that's when the nausea and the gastrointestinal problems come in. So I really just need to take care of it as soon as I can. Oh, this is interesting. Heat seekers to the brain physical and social warmth are one and the same. So, this is interesting. Um, makes me think of, I mean, I guess it's part of the fact that, like, for example, when you're in a situation where you're embarrassed and you feel, you know, your face feels flushed, the blood rushes to your face. Um, it kind of makes me think of that. So, maybe social warmth is associated with that. Maybe there is some connection. I don't know. That would be an interesting study to do, though. To, you know, um, to, uh, test, I guess, take a person's temperature while they're in various social situations and see if that goes along with how warm they say the situation is. I mean, I don't know if that study's been done already or not.
logic test and partly like a what would you do in this situation test. So like partly personality test. So that was really interesting to sort of, you know, see if you're the right kind of person for the job, not only intellectually, but personality wise. the 
person you want them to be. Um, avoid topics that get you into trouble. Don't try to get them to see your point of view. Don't try to explain yourself or get them to empathize with you. Create a distraction. Play with a pet if there's one handy. Plan the interaction around some kind of recreational activity or entertainment. Get the other person to do something that absorbs their attention. Just don't use alcohol as a distraction. It will only make you more likely to say or do something that will set you up as a target or make you feel bad later. So, there you go. Um, some ways to diffuse a difficult encounter. Um, some stuff on difficult people. And, yeah, I hope that you guys learned something from this. I didn't think we'd be able to spend this much time on one magazine, but I guess there was a lot of interesting stuff in this one. 